Psalm 82 has a passage that describes God sitting among other beings who are called gods. Who are these beings? Are these angels? Are these fallen angels? What does this passage mean? Well, we're going to explore that mystery and have a fun night getting into the Divine Council tonight on Thursday Night Theology. Greetings. God bless wherever you are in the world. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Peterson. Welcome to Thursday Night Theology, the show that is about you, about your questions. We're taking the mysterious aspects of the Bible, prophecy, the supernatural, the Nephilim, the angelic realm, the fallen angels, the demons. We're looking at all those things and much more. And just me trying to apply my best research to uh, try and find an answer for you. And so who am I? Why am I, why am I here? Why is anyone even listening to what I have to say? I'm, again, my name is Ryan Peterson. I'm your host. I'm also author of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6, uh, the fallen angels, the days of Noah. Why did we have a flood? What is that talking about in the Bible? Well, it's not why many churches teach. It's actually about the a prophecy given in Genesis about the Messiah and how the devil's plan to try and thwart the birth of the Messiah by corrupting humanity genetically, morally, spiritually through these beings, the Nephilim, the hybrid offspring of the sons of God, fallen angels and the daughters of men. All of that and more is in judgment of the Nephilim. I'm also going to just throw up my socials while I do my intro. If you want to know where to find me. Additionally, I'm the author of The Final Nephilim, which is the sequel that goes from Revelation, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, exploring end time prophecies, the rise of Antichrist, the return of the fallen angels. What did Jesus mean in Matthew 24 when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man? Well, the answers to that and much, much more it gets into the UFO phenomenon, quantum physics, uh, transhumanism, all that and much more in the final Nephilim. But we'll get more into that later again tonight. This is about, this show is about your questions, answering your questions, getting into the Bible, getting deep into scripture and a great time of fellowship. And as a matter of fact, you know, I'm actually going to just jump in the comments right now from the beginning and give some shout outs. So uh, I see Anasia's here, uh, Steelers girl, moldy soldier in a flash. All right, we got some, some of the, uh, True Thursday Night Theology Fellowship members here. I see Ida from North, from North Georgia. Greetings. And Peggy Pauline from Indiana. And Peggy Pauline says she got her documentaries. Excellent. Glad you got them. You're very welcome. And on that note, as always, there's going to be two prizes for two live viewers tonight. You will receive prizes. I'm going to select two people at random. They will be selected at random at the end of the show. Additionally, if you're watching on replay and you have a question, don't fear. Put them in the comment section. I use these questions, the comments from my social media. You see it on the bottom here, whether it's my YouTube channel, my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as well uh, for questions for future episodes. And we have some great questions tonight. So we're going to look at three, three questions tonight. So first is Psalm 82 in this passage where it talks about God uh, referring to beings as gods and sitting among the gods. And what does that mean? Who are those beings referring to? Are they angels? Is this any credibility to this idea of a divine council in scripture? So we're going to look at that. Our second question, and I, you know, it's really amazing how so many times, you know, God really is the producer of this show because the questions in one week all kind of flow together. The second question we're going to look at is, well, if God cannot stand before evil or withstand or, or tolerate evil in his presence, see or be near evil, how is it that Satan can hold a council with God, as we see in the book of Job? So we're going to explore that. And then the third question, a uh, really interesting question, deals with the timing of Antichrist. And if the devil knows, if the devil is, you know, the thesis of the final Nephilim, and here's a copy of it right here. The thesis of the final Nephilim is really about the rise of Antichrist. And I go through in Judgment of the Nephilim looking at the prophecy of Messiah in Genesis 3.15. But there's another seed, the Antichrist, who is prophesied. And the thesis of the book is that, that he is the literal offspring of the devil. So the third question is, how is the devil going to know when it is time to 
can see the Antichrist. What is the timing? How could the devil know? The devil doesn't know the timing of the end times. How does he know to conceive the Antichrist, obviously, who have, obviously has to grow up into a man before he comes into power? So great question. So we're going to look at that um, and see what scripture says about that, that mystery as well. So excellent questions. And again, this is a great time for fellowship. Share where you're from and engage with each other in a good spe- good spirit of Christian fellowship. Let's be kind. Let's be nice. But share where you're from. Share ideas. And also put thumbs up, like the video, uh, put some hearts in the room in the chat if uh, if you're watching on Facebook. And we're going to jump right into question number one. Okay, so What is the meaning of the phrase gods in Psalm 82? Is it a reference to angels? And this is from Anasya. And congrats. Shout out to Anasya, who is our first uh, viewer to have questions two weeks in a row. You know, I try to really have a variety of the questions, but the other questions were flowing into this question. So it really kind of came together. So shout out to you for getting to having two thought provoking questions, two shows in a row. So We're going to, of course, look at Psalm 82 in its entirety and really try and flesh out what is happening here and what this passage is talking about and how it connects to this idea of a divine council. So here is Psalm 82, the whole chapter. And of course, we're going to start right from verse one. And there we read, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And again, that's the entire uh, chapter of Psalm 82, verses 1 to 8. And so we're going to obviously really unpack this, but I submit that that this passage is indeed referring to angels. And in fact, it is what Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, of course, a biblical researcher, uh, scholar and professor uh, on ancient Semitic culture and Eastern culture and ancient Hebrew languages, uh, coined, kind of coined this phrase of a divine council. And I think what it's describing is God literally holding a meeting with other angels, both righteous and fallen and evil angels to essentially go over different affairs in the world and 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 carry out his will, essentially. So I believe Psalm 82 uh, is an example of that. And of course, we're going to look back at the passage and look at some of the key phrases here. And so from the beginning, we see that it's saying that God is standing in this congregation of the mighty. And I believe this is, again, referring to a heavenly congregation. If you think about Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, where Satan is giving his five aspirations. He says he wants to sit atop of the mount of the congregation. This is a desire to rule heaven. And look what it says. It says in Psalm, in verse one, we see this congregation of the mighty. It says that God, he, God, judgeth among the gods. And we see that term here is Elohim, the same Hebrew term used for God. Uh, And so God is right here. We're ascribing this lower G God. So who are these beings? And I believe as we continue this, this, passage is really a plea for justice against the fallen angels. And you see this reference to the highlighted reference where it says, I have said, ye are gods, Elohim, and all of you are children of the most high. And of course, we know from Genesis 6, verse 4, again, we see this idea of children, the sinning angels in Genesis 6 who fathered the Nephilim were called the Banai Ha Elohim, sons of God. And these were fallen angels as confirmed by the second Peter chapter 2 and Jude verses six and seven. So let's go back to Psalm 82. And I think we see a part of this chapter that confirms again that we're talking about angels, that angels are in view and in particular fallen angels. And so if you see here in the second of the, the final highlighted part of the passage, it says, 
that they are gods and children of the most high, but they shall die like men. So God is saying, eventually they're going to be judged. God is going to judge the fallen angels. And ultimately they're gonna suffer the same fate as a fallen human being. And so this is really contrasting the fallen angels, the angels from the true God, the God of gods, El Elyon, the most high, and of course, it says that arise, O God. It's, David concludes by saying, arise, O God, the God, the creator God, El Elyon, and judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations, that heaven and earth, of course, ultimately belong to God. And God will re officially reclaim them, of course, at his second coming. So that's, I think, in summary, kind of what the thesis here. But I think we see other examples of this being supported, this idea of this divine gathering, congregation, council, whatever you, you know, choose your term. But I think we see other examples of this. So let's look at a couple. So here are the, the clear examples we see here. This is in Job chapter one, and this is in verses, uh, verses, verses six and seven. And we read, now there was a day when the sons of God, but not ha Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So clearly we see here angels. This is in heaven. They're presenting themselves before the throne of God. And you see the sons of God, the same class of angels that are referenced in Genesis 6, 4. And it says the devil was among them. So we have God and Satan speaking directly to each other. We see the second example right here in Job chapter 2. And there was a, again, there was a day when the sons of God, Benai Ha Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So these passages really even though they repeat, they reveal a lot. This is our peak. We get very few glimpses in scripture into heaven, into this type of interaction. We have angels and the devil speaking directly to God. So these chapters have a lot of powerful revelation and doctrine in them. And you see that clearly God is having a meeting and, and holding Satan accountable to say, Where, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? And Satan has to report in and answer to God. So I think this is an example, and I referenced already Dr. Michael Heiser, and he really, I, I believe, in at least in modern times, was the, the the key kind of researcher and theologian to really drive this point home. So I want to go to one of his um one of his initial articles that he wrote uh, over a decade ago, but that really expounded upon Psalm 82. That was definitely a big influence on me and really helped open my eyes to a lot of things in Scripture. Uh, so let's look at, at, at a, a, so an excerpt from his article. So again, this is Dr. Michael Heiser, and he writes, All the figures called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible have one thing in common. They all inhabit the non-human realm. That is, they are by nature not part of the world of humankind, a world of necessary embodiment. Elohim is what I call a place of residence term. It identifies the proper domain of the entity described by it. It labels the entity in terms of its residence, if you will. Yahweh, the lesser gods, angels, demons, and the disembodied dead are all rightful inhabitants of the spiritual non-human world. So here he's clearly saying that Elohim, when you see Elohim, whether it's Benaiha Elohim, ben Ahelo Elohim, children of the Most High, that it's always referring to a heavenly realm, spirit realm being. So let's continue. They may be able to cross over to our world, as scripture tells us, and certain humans may be transported to their realm, prophets, for example, Enoch, but their proper domain and our proper domain are two separate places. This is something called the veil that I explore in the final Nephilim series you can find on my YouTube channel. This idea of the separation between the heavenly and the spirit realm. Within the spiritual world, there is ontological differentiation, rank, and power. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. Should the plural Elohim of Psalm 82, uh, and so, I'm sorry, and this is from the article entitled, Should the Plural Elohim of Psalm 82 Be Understood as Men or Divine Beings? And so that was an article he wrote in 2010. And again, I think this really, this really, really 
inspired a lot of great research that came out of this from articles, documentaries, books that have been really took, took this and really expanded on our understanding of the spirit realm and scripture. And so, uh, and I think it's very clear that he's, what he's saying, his point, Dr. Heiser's point here is that this is a reference that when you see Elohim, that it's not, um, that the, and certainly in the ancient Hebrew understanding, the term God did not just refer to Yahweh, the creator God, I am that I am. It could refer to angels. It did not, it was not solely reserved. In our modern uh, thinking, in our modern doctrine, often in theology, we often think of the idea of calling any other being in the Bible a God is blasphemy because it's only one God and we're monotheistic. But again, in the ancient Semitic understanding, the term God could apply to angels as well as we see, or sons of God, children of God. So let's look at some other examples. I think also, again, drive this home. And we're going to find some, I think, some really, really compelling examples here. And so here we're looking at Deuteronomy 32 as to what's going on here. This is Deuteronomy 32, chapter 32, verses 7 to 9. And I think this is really interesting to show what these angels were doing, what God was bringing forth in this idea of a divine council and says, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask thy father and he will shew thee, thy elders and they will tell thee. When the most high divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, this is Moses reflecting back on Genesis chapters 10 and 11. When we see the division of nations in the days of Abraham. And this is when God basically decided that he was going to form his own nation and his own people out of one man. Abraham, of course, the father of the faith, who is the father of, of Isaac, who's the father of Jacob, who became Israel. Right. And his children were the 12 tribes of Israel. This is how God created his nation. But. Look at how we're going to look at this verse again, this key verse again in the Septuagint, which is, of course, the oldest extant version of the Old Testament translated from the Paleo Hebrew and often quoted by Jesus, the Lord and the disciples in the New Testament. And look at the verse here. Here's Deuteronomy 32, 8 from the Septuagint. And it says, when the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And this, I believe, is the proper rendering. I believe what this passage is saying is that God literally gave dominion over the nations of the world. We see in the table of nations in Genesis 10 and 11 to the angels. And again, going back to see verse nine above the highlight section in the first passage, it says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So rather than taking a country he took a people through Abraham, through Israel, and said, I'm going to start my nation through one person and build a nation there from Abraham. So that's, he said, you, you guys can take the rest, essentially. I'm taking this man and I'm building my nation out of him, which, of course, is what happened with the nation of Israel. We see further confirmation of this, uh, I believe, in the book of Daniel. And this is where I think we get the clear confirmation. We're going to look at one example, then we're going to go to the book of Daniel. But we'll see, look at another example that I think drives this home. And that's in Deuteronomy 419. We see, I think this, again, is in the same book in Deuteronomy. It says, and this is a warning against idolatry. And we read, unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even the whole, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. So this is a warning saying, do not do this, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So here God's telling us the heavenly host, the host is the army, the angelic armies of God. It says that which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all the nations. So they were again, there's this idea of the nations being divided in accordance with it, with certain angels. And then we see further confirmation of this in Daniel chapter 10, which is the second passage here. And we're looking at verses 12 and 13. And here we read, then said he unto me, and of course, just to give some context, this is uh, Daniel having a conversation He'd been praying for 21 days and fasting, uh, of course, for Israel's um, essentially redemption. When And 
he's waiting on and praying and the angel Gabriel finally shows up and is explaining to him what took so long for him to arrive. That it took 21 days for him to keep praying and fasting for his prayer to be answered. And here we read again, this is verses 12 and 13 in Daniel chapter 10. Then said, then said he unto me, meaning Gabriel, fear not Daniel from, for, for, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard and I am come for thy words. So he's saying from the first day you prayed, God heard you and sent me. So what caused the delay? It's the highlighted section here. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. So what happened? He was fighting with a prince. I believe this is angelic warfare. This is spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. He's saying that this prince, this angelic prince, this fallen angel who was assigned to the kingdom of Persia, fought me. And we were fighting for 21 days. But lo, Michael, of course, this is the archangel Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So again, just amazing revelation. The angel saying very clearly, I was fighting with an angel for three weeks, for 21 days. And it, until Michael came, who of course is the archangel who's assigned over Israel. Dan, Daniel's later told, he's, Michael's called your prince, meaning the prince over your people, Israel, came and assisted him. Was he able to make it to Daniel? So again, we're seeing this idea that this angel, a principality, right? A principality we see in Ephesians chapter six, which says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness. A uh, principality it refers to a location. So I believe these are the angels who have dominion over certain nations or kingdoms, in this case, Persia. And of course, that chapter in Daniel 10 concludes with the angel saying, I'm leaving you now and I'll return to fight the king. I'm going back to fight the prince of Persia again. And when he's gone, the prince of Greece will come. So like, amazing. So, of course, you know, in the in the order of just secular history, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Persian Empire was conquered by the Greek Empire, by Alexander the Great. So not only is this an amazing prophecy of, of history, because he's saying the next angel to come is going to be from Greece. It's also, again, confirming and affirming this concept that angels have certain angels are assigned to certain nations. So. Again, I think just further confirmation of what's going on here and how these angels can not only confer with God, they're given even assignment by God, both good and fallen angels. And so now we're going to look at some of the older, um, more ancient research that I think also supports this idea. And so this is from uh, a 19th century theologian, and we're going to just look at Again, looking at this idea of God, Yahweh, and gods being angels and hitting on this exact question. And here it reads, the word God expresses his omnipotence, thus has relation to power, as is evident from these passages in the word when the names are distinguished. He gives examples of three verses, Isaiah 49, 4 to 5, 55 and 7, Psalm 18, verses 2 and 28, 29 and 31, Psalm 31, 14. On this account, every angel or spirit who conversed with man and who was supposed to possess any power was called God, as appears in David, quote, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth, he judgeth among the gods. Again, quoting Psalm 82, verse 1, our passage in question. And in another place, quote, who in the heaven can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the gods can be likened unto the Lord? Psalm 89, 6. Again, quote, O give thanks unto the God of gods. O give thanks unto the Lord of lords. Psalm 136, verses 2 and 3. And I think that last verse really drives home this point that God is even called the God of gods, that he rules over the lesser gods. So even in scripture is affirming this idea again, that God is ruling among the lower G gods who are the angels. And finishing this passage, it says, since, however, the angels do not possess the least power of themselves, as they indeed acknowledge, but derive all they have solely from the Lord, as there is but one God. Therefore, by Jehovah God, in the word is meant the Lord alone, where, however, anything that is affected by the ministry of angels, there he is spoken of in the plural number, meaning 
Benaycha Elohim, Beni Elohim, and this is from our Heavenly Father's book, William Benjamin Hayden, 1884. And just to just to drive a point home again, you know, the word Elohim in Hebrew is like the word sheep in English, right? Sheep can be singular or plural, even the same word. And so Elohim is the same type of word in Hebrew. So that's what he's saying when he means it's singular, referring to the Lord alone, Jehovah God, Yahweh, but plural when it refers to the ministry of angels, sons of God, children, plural of the Almighty, right? So, or the gods, right? The God of gods, plural. So again, um, just uh, driving that point home. So let's see what else we have here. Did we do that? Okay. I'm going to go to one more uh, quote on this, and I think also has made some very good points here. This is also from our 19th century theologian. It says, Elohim, they say, is used for judges in Exodus 21 and 22. So this is, again, this is taking on the argument. This is referring to human men, judges, magistrates. And he says, it is not. It means there, as it always means, either God or so-called gods, or at least supernatural beings. So again, confirming Heiser's interpretation that when you see Elohim, it's a heavenly realm being, a spirit realm being. In those verses of Exodus, it means God is represented by the judges who give his, who gave in his name, that the sacred writer could speak of a man as coming before God when he appeared before the theocratic judge only shows how awful was the religious sanction which attached to this decision in those old world days. The revised version has very properly restored the word God in all these cases. Quote, God standeth in the congregation of God. He judgeth among the gods. Again, quoting Psalm 82. As supreme judge of all created beings, he begins with his own counselors, the angel princes. Exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 10. There's an angel who's called a prince, who, like himself, are heavenly and supernatural who when looked at from below may even be counted as gods. Meaning when looked at from inferior humans, we can, we can see they seem like they seem godlike. The angels seem godlike in comparison to humans. Cause of course we're made lower than them. In this inferior sense, the Psalmist himself acknowledges their claim to the title, but at the same time, he warns them, he denounces them. He threatens them with an absence of restraint, which nothing could justify or excuse except an overmastering sense of pity and indignation at the cruelty and wrong which filled the earth. And that's from the Angel Princes of Daniel in a magazine called The Expositor in 1911. So what is this saying? It's saying again that, you know, from even from David's standpoint, writing that Psalm, Psalm 82, he calls them gods. But look at what he says. Let's go back to the original passage. It says, but you shall die like men. It's, remember, this is a passage that's calling out the angels for being wicked and says, you shall you shall die like men and fall like the princes. So they're not, ultimately, they're not Yahweh. They're not the God of God. They are created beings who are, can be judged. And in the case of the fallen angels will be judged. And so God, of course, will meet with them and carry out affairs with them and discuss with them and even talk to the devil. But uh, at the end of the day, there's only one true creator God, Yahweh, El Elyon, the most high God. And so that's my answer to question number one. So I believe, yes, it is a divine counsel. It is a reference to angels and God can speak to them. God can judge them. And we're going to find out even more things, interesting things that go on. So that's the answer to question number one. So uh, thanks again for that question. And tonight, I didn't announce what the prize is for tonight. You know, I, I was so blessed, you know, show and tell time real quick. You know, I've mentioned a couple of times that I went to recently spoke at the uh, Homeward Bound Conference sp sponsored by Prophecy Watchers uh, in Colorado Springs um, just a few weeks ago. Shout out to anyone who was there. I appreciate it. Ivan was there. Chris Fox, uh, uh, great friend and frequent viewer of Thursday Night Theology. Shout out to you as well. He was not only did he hang out, we got to fellowship, eat together, and he was a huge help uh, to me uh, during, during the entire time. It was a wonderful time. But also I want to mention, I was blessed. I mentioned before that uh, Stacy, a young woman, Stacy, who I had met at my first conference, had an idea for a book called The Dragon Kingdom. She gave me a copy of hers, but she's, she's now published. So great to see. But I also met other authors there. So I just want to give a thanks. I haven't read these books yet, but I'm going on vacation soon. So I'm looking forward to getting some some serious reading of other people's writing. So this is a book called uh, Witnessing the End, about Daniel's 70 Weeks. It's by Christian Widener. So I just appreciate him. He, he came by and gave me a book. This one's interesting titled The United States of Israel. And so that's by Jackie Alnor. Uh, also, 
Very, very provocative. Whoops. Drop, didn't, didn't drop the book. <laughs> drop something else. Um, Randall Price, who many of you know, uh, very prolific author, Jerusalem in Prophecy. He um, blessed me with this book for free. And Doug Hamp, who I mentioned, Corrupting the Image Part 3. And again, I just want to give a shout out and thanks to all of them because it was just great to fellowship. And also, they just were willing to just give me their books for free. So I appreciate it. And of course, I gave them books as well. But it's um, all a part of the great fellowship that I hope everyone's enjoying tonight here as well as we get into the text. So we're going to take a quick break. And oh, yeah, I forgot to say. So, yes, the prize for tonight. The one thing I learned in Colorado Springs that was great is that there were a lot of attendees. Like I said, it was the biggest conference I intended, I've ever spoken at. It was almost a thousand people there. And there were many people there who were not, even though I spoke on the final Nephilim, there were many people there who had never heard of me at all. And so uh, they got to also see my first book. And so that, so in honor of people who may not be familiar with me at all, our prize for tonight is going to be an autographed copy of Judgment of the Nephilim, my first book. And so, uh, Stay tuned for the end of the show. Two people are going to win a, again, as always, a free copy will be shipped to you anywhere in the world free of charge. And we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to play one of the original trailers for Judgment of the Nephilim. So enjoy that. And we'll be back soon for question number two. Ryan has written uh, this book. It's called Judgment of the Nephilim. And uh, this book uh, is going to go down in history as making a difference. And I'll tell you why. And Ryan. Well, I'm here with Ryan Peterson, author of a new book on the Nephilim. It may be, become the go to book. Uh, in, in the near future. I think it already is, and I just, congratulations.
All right. So yeah, that was the uh the trailer that started it all. Man, it brings me back. It brings me it brings back great memories. Um making that trailer and also obviously the amazing experience is the blessing that God brought so many people into my life right away. So I got to meet Gary Stearman uh shortly after the book was published and also Ellie Marzuli. We got to hang out and go out to eat in New York City in my hometown. So uh we had a great time and I appreciate all their amazing feedback on the book. So that is my first book and again uh, two people are going to receive a free autograph copy tonight at the end of the show sent to you wherever you are in the world. And of course, you can find that and much more at judgmentofthenephilim.com. Um, so without further ado, and if I didn't mention it too, also, you know, if they have time, I will do, uh, if there is time, I will do some overtime questions. If you have questions, of course, just drop them in the chat as the night goes on. So, all right. Let me take down our banner here and let's get to question number two. Okay. If God cannot be near sin or evil, how was Satan able to hold a council with him as we see in Job chapter one? And this question is from Carlos. Carlos, thank you so much for that question. Great question. Of course, we're going to obviously look at Job chapter one, but I think also this concept that God can't be in the presence of sin or evil. Uh, it's an interesting concept. And I guess off the bat, we have to start there and where it comes from. And I believe it comes from uh, the book of Habakkuk. And so we're going to look at the passage in Habakkuk uh, that I believe is where this idea comes from, but I don't think it's actually the case. I don't think that that this concept that God cannot exist in the presence of evil, I don't think that that's actually what the Bible says. And so we're going to look at this passage and then I think, of course, go to Job chapter one, and I think flesh out why I think the Bible does not actually state that or support that notion. So let's, let's jump right into Habakkuk chapter one. And so we're going to look at verses 12 and 13, because I think this is where the key passage is that kind of supports this idea, because I've heard this idea many times myself throughout the years. And starting at verse 12, we read, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So you see here in the yellow highlighted section, I believe this is where most articles or pastors base this concept on, is that it says that God's eyes are, pu are too pure, essentially, to behold evil, and he cannot look upon iniquity. He can't look at sin. And that kind of morphed into this idea that God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so, again, I don't think that's what this passage is actually saying. I think that what uh, Habakkuk is doing is he's he's praising God, but he's also trying to drive home a point. He's out outlining the nature of God, but he's outlining a point because the first chapter of this book, it's a very Habakkuk is a very interesting book. He's asking a lot of questions of God. He's really asking, what is going on? I am praying and you are not responding. I'm asking for things and I'm getting no answer. There's evil taking place. Why aren't you doing something right? This is one of the quintessential questions, not just for Christians, for human beings in for all of existence. If God exists, why isn't God responding? Why isn't God doing something? Why is God acting? Of course, acting in accordance with what we think God should be doing, right? God is always acting, but it's according to his perfect will. But of course, in our humanity, in our sinful flesh, in our myopic view of the world and of who God is, um, that's what we think, right? And so this is this is what the, the book is asking. I think we, we go back a few verses, we're going to see this and look at the context of this passage. And this is actually starting in verse one of chapter one. And it says, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet, prophet did see. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? So right from the onset, 
he's speaking of God not hearing his prayers, his cries, right? Now, did God truly not hear him? Does he really think that? I don't think so. I don't think what he's saying is that God was incapable of hearing him or somehow missed what he said. It's that God isn't responding. Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou will not save. So again, notice that it's Habakkuk asserting what he thinks God should be doing, as opposed to saying, God, you are incapable of saving me, or God, you're incapable of hearing me. All right, let's continue. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? So now he's saying, now God is fully involved in saying, God, why are you showing me evil? Why are you putting all this evil in front of me, all the wrongs that were happening to him, to his people, and causing me to behold grievance? For for spoiling and violence are before me. Of course, this is referring to it's taking, stealing, con the conquest of Israel, the northern and southern kingdoms, right? They get spoiled. They are their goods, their wealth is taken from them. And there are, there are that, that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never, never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. And man, how many times do we feel this way, right? As Christians, it's like we see evil taking place and we're like, why is this happening? Why is it, what is going on that there's so much wrong taking place in the world, right? And again, and I think this is, and this I think is the beauty of the Bible that Habakkuk is really, really saying a lot of things that aren't correct about God and really challenging God. God allows us to be in scripture, right? God wants us to see the humanity of his prophets just because they're going through the same thing, right? Scripture tells us that Elijah, who did all these great things, said he was of like passions as us. He was no different. He was not a superhero. He was not a superman. There are no supermen in the Bible. You have Jesus, who is God in the flesh. He is supernatural. And, and, and as human beings, we're just all, they're all flesh and blood sinners like us. And so he's just pouring out his heart. And so I think that's, the context of what he's saying, he says, God, you're not saving. You don't hear me. And he says, your eyes, you're so pure. Going back to the original passage, he's saying, you're so holy. But therefore, why look upon them that deal treacherously? Treacherously. So he's saying, you know, use your eyes. See what's going on. You're holding your tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. He's saying, basically, why aren't you looking at this? Why aren't you looking at them? Why aren't you speaking out when the wicked man is devouring the righteous, right? So I think that's that's where it's coming from. I believe the context shows that it's really Habakkuk pouring out his soul to Yahweh saying, I just want you to do something. Why aren't you hearing me? You're not seeing me. Why aren't you acting, right? And so, and so, yeah, so I don't, so I don't believe, I do believe that God can be in the presence of evil. I do believe that. And uh, of course we see, an example of that from question one, we looked at two examples where the devil is standing before God and God says, where, where have you come from? Going to and fro in the earth. So we see clear examples from the divine counsel in Job chapters one and two, that certainly the devil himself can stand before God. So we know he can be in the presence of evil and sin. But let's look at more examples. Revelation chapter 12, and this is a powerful example, right? This is this is the, the, the when John sees in Revelation the war in heaven between, and we just let's pick it up right in verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we're clearly talking about the devil here which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast with him. So this is when Satan is evicted from heaven permanently. I believe this takes place at the fifth trumpet of Revelation in chapter nine, the midpoint of the seven years. But continuing, it says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Why? For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So not only can the devil appear before God, it's saying that this well, basically one of the main things that the devil is doing is actually in heaven, not on earth. It's in heaven standing before God. And what is he doing? He's accusing the brethren, us. He's trying to prove to God that we're wicked, that we're not worthy of salvation. Of course, secret theories, we're not worthy. 
Jesus makes us worthy. But that's, you know, that's that's the true gospel. But of course, the devil doesn't have the spirit of God to discern spiritual things. So he's going to keep looking at us, per, our personal behavior and trying to be the naughty police to, to prove to God and accuse us to show that we are we, we should be destroyed alongside him, essentially. But look what it says. He's accusing day and night. So clearly the devil can stand before God. But let's go back. And uh, oh, here's another great example, too. This 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 is a really interesting passage here. So this is from Zechariah chapter chapter one. And uh, it says, and he showed me uh, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuked thee. So again, this is Joshua, the high priest. So just, just, just to clarify, this is not uh, Joshua from the book of Joshua. This is the high priest in the days of Zerubbabel. This is at the time of the rebuilding of the temple when Israel, uh, the, the, the tribes are now returning from the Babylonian captivity, just to give the context here. And it says, he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So again, this is God and this is God on his throne and Joshua, the high priest is before him. And there is Satan standing at Joshua's right hand. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that had chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Isn't, isn't this interesting? And stood, stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the, film, the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. So this is God telling Joshua, I have forg he's forgiving his sins. So I believe this is Jesus on his throne. And, uh, and not the Father. No man hath seen the Father except the Son. So I believe this is Jesus on his throne forgiving him of his sins, redeeming him. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Of course, sim always symbolic of the cleanliness of Christ, being cleaned of your sins. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments and the angel of the Lord stood by. So we see here, not only is the devil, who of course is evil before God, but Joshua in his sinful state is standing before God and God in front, right there, cleanses him and forgives him of his sin. So again, we see God in the presence of sinful, both sinful angels and sinful humanity. And that passage, by the way, with Joshua and the devil, I have such a theory about that passage. I mean, that I've never shared, I've never written, and I'm, oh, I'm bursting at the seams to share it right now, but I have to continue researching it. I don't like sharing new theories unless I'm dogmatic about it. So it will be on a video. I'm not, it's not for a book or anything like that. It's just something I, I think I've discovered about that passage, but I can't talk about it yet. But man, I'm just itching to get it out. So, uh, but I will continue researching it and share it in a future episode. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I digress. So um, let's see if we have anything else that we want to touch on here. Oh, yeah. So so we see that, again, this is the idea that God clearly can be in the presence of evil, of sin. And even from a doctrinal standpoint, the beauty of God is that he even took on our sin and became sin for us. And, of course, this is what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verses 17 to 21, you know, foundational doctrine here as a Christian. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What happened to Joshua in Zechariah? He received new garments. They removed his old garments and gave him new garments. See that already we're seeing this, the foreshadowing, the typology of the redemptive work of Christ. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So again, this is God taking, he's the author of our salvation. He's doing all the work to, to forgive us, to give us eternal life, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So he's not imputing sin to us, the them is us, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we... Our ambassadors of Christ, Christians, as though as though God did beseech you by us. So it's saying that we're ambassadors of God himself to say, I'm appointing you to this role to speak on my behalf. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So it's saying that Jesus Christ, who was sinless, 
who this is why he was the seed of the woman. He was not of the, he didn't inherit the sin nature from Adam. He became sin for us. He literally took on our sin, even though he knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, that's 2 Corinthians 5, chapter uh, verses 17 to 21. So not only can God be in the presence of sin, he loved us so much, he took our own sin. He took the presence of all our sins upon him uh, and took our punishment so that we can be forgiven and have eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's my answer to question number two. And so I uh, hope that uh, that was good. Hope that sparked some discussion. And let's uh, let's see. Yeah, we can talk about, we'll take a quick break. We will talk about the documentary. So I mentioned the books, Judgment of the Nephilim, The Final Nephilim. There are also documentaries, yes, available in DVD and video on demand. They're actually on demand. If you want to watch them, they're in video on demand. You can watch them from the comfort of your home, your tablet, your TV, your laptop. And so what are the documentaries for? They are high level overviews of the books. So they are basically go over the bigger concepts in the book and I made them to be easily accessible. I wanted to have the, the information from these books in a format for whether you want to just get the basics, whether you want to get deep or get really deep. We have the study guides for that. And so, but the documentaries are the high level overviews. If you want to understand the book in a night, um, this is it. Get your popcorn ready and watch it. So uh, we're going to watch a quick trailer for the documentaries and come back for question number three and Lord willing, some overtime. This is the account that will take us to the culmination of the battle between Christ and Antichrist. I'm Ryan Peterson, author of The Final Nephilim. Okay, so that is the trailer for the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth, the documentary based on my second book. And there's also a Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, of course, again, which are available at judgmentofthenephilim.com, as well as Vimeo On Demand, if you want to watch it digitally. And so I'm not going to run the ticker for that. I am going to run the ticker for Zechariah Chapter 3. I apologize. I said Zechariah 1 for the passage with Joshua and Satan. Uh, that is Zechariah chapter three, not chapter one. So that was uh, my mistake. Apologies for that. But I do have, like I said, uh, I will keep researching and hopefully come back with the theory of what I think. I think that is some major implications to that passage. Uh, but stay tuned for more on that. So wanted to clarify that. Um, and now let's get to question number three. Actually, let me take a quick look in the comments, see what's going on here. Let's see. All right. Someone said, yes, we are made a little a little lower than the angels. Yes, that is true. That is how the Bible made us. We are a little lower than the angels. So let's get to question number three, though. Let's see here. Oh, this is a really interesting one. OK, so if Satan fathers the Antichrist, how will he know the timing of his birth or conception? Right. And so this is really, uh, I've never been asked this question before. So this is really, really interesting, right? Right. Obviously, again, most theologians, pastors, Christians are going to agree whether, regardless of what your end times kind of doctrine is, most, most Christians agree and most Bible students agree that the Antichrist, of course, is going to reign during the Great Tribulation, the final seven years uh, before the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ to earth to conquer the devil, the, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the forces of evil at Armageddon, the battle or battles of Armageddon, excuse me. So we all understand that. And obviously the Antichrist is going to be a grown man. He's going to be an adult man at this time. But 
if he's born, if he's born of a woman, which I believe he is, if he's a seed, just as God said in Genesis 3.15, he said, God said, I'll put amity between speaking to the devil, between thy seed and her seed, the prophecy of Messiah and anti-Messiah, Christ and Antichrist, that they're going to be at war with each other. And so I believe just as we understand the seed of the woman being a literal person, not an allegory, not a metaphor, it was Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, that the other seed, when he said thy seed to the devil, that is a reference to his seed, the Antichrist. And so but when is he going to be born? How will the devil know it's time for the conception of Antichrist or birth of Antichrist? How can you know the timing? So I think that the passages we read tonight actually reveal what I think is potentially the answer. And so that's what we're going to look at. And I think that uh, I think the way he's going to know, I believe that I believe um, that God is going to tell him. And so let's let's see why. And so I think what we see it where I think we see confirmation of how this could possibly possibly be the case, again, goes back to the book of Job. In Job chapter one, we've already looked at the fact that obviously that we see God speaking to Satan and saying, where are you, where are you coming from? He said, going to and fro and fro in the earth, right? But let's look at the rest of that passage. And I think we're going to find some interesting things here, some interesting revelations. So let's, let's, let's look at Job here. And okay, so I just want to I just want to set the stage here. So God, of course, tells the devil, "Have you considered my servant Job?" And he says, "There's none more righteous than him in this earth, upstanding." He said, basically, he's a great believer in me. And Satan says, "Well, the only reason why Job even worships you is because you've given him a lot of stuff. He's wealthy. He has a wonderful family. He has lots of kids. He's successful. That's the only reason why. If you take away his things, all the nice things, he's never going to worship you. It's only because he's getting something from you, right? Prosperity gospel, essentially, that you receive something from God. You have a great relationship with God. And so, and of course, God says, and initially, actually, the devil says, you put a hedge around him. You put a hedge of protection around him so I can't touch him. And God says, I will let you, you know, damage things in this life, but don't don't touch him. And so Satan gets this one kind of set of parameters from God and goes berserk. Look at what he does when he's just told, OK, you can harm things in his life, but don't harm him. And look at the reaction from this, it says, and there was a day when his sons, meaning Job's sons and his daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away, so took all their all their livestock. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and burned up the sh and have burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out of uh, three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. So look at the damage that the devil wreaks. He told, he, remember, God said, he, the devil told God, I can't even harm this guy because you put a hedge of protection around him. And the moment God says, I'm going to allow you to harm things in his life, the devil goes on an immediate attack. He sends people to steal his livestock, slaughter his servants. And notice what it says here, too. It says that the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now, of course, throughout the Old Testament, fire from heaven was actually a sign of God's approval of God sanctifying something. We see fire from heaven at the dedication of the temple. Uh, when Manoah, the father uh, the, the father of Samson, makes a sacrifice, uh, it's consumed in fire by the angel of God. And so by the fire of God. And so here they call it the fire of God, but it's from the devil. And it's destroying uh, Job's livestock. And so look, it says, and it's burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And this is the Chaldeans came and carried away the camels. So clearly God is telling, giving these parameters and the devil then goes to act. And it continues and says, yea, and the slain the servants with the edge of the sword and true and only and I only am escaped to tell thee. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And again, this is Job 1, verses 13 to 19. So the devil goes into immediate supernatural action. He's bringing supernatural tornadoes to crush the house. He's bringing fire from heaven. He's instigating these attacks. Why? Because God has now given him permission to do this. He's authorized him to do this, and he immediately goes into action. Let's continue. This is in Job chapter 2. So now, of course, uh, the Lord says this is the next time they have a divine counsel in chapter 2. And they're, now they're speaking again, the devil and God. And the Lord says unto Satan, have, have, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, and one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast with integrity. Although thou movest me against him, destroy him without cause. So he's saying, look, because, of course, after Job suffered all this tragic loss, the loss of his children, his wealth, his livestock, his servants. He says, you know, naked I've come into the world from the womb, naked I return to, you know, out of the world. I will die. I'm just paraphrasing. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? So he said, despite all that, he praised God. He did not curse God. He didn't blaspheme God in any of these things after suffering all this tragedy. So God says, look, he's righteous. He's, he is, he's faithful. He said, even though, and look what it says here. Look at the, it says, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So again, this is talking about you got me to give you authorization to harm him, to do something in the world. And Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man have, he will give for his life. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bone in his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. So again, the devil's challenging God saying, hey, listen. All, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff happened. Yeah, he's still praising you. But if I harm his body and put his life in jeopardy, he's going to curse you. He will have no faith in you. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So when Satan from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So again, notice God is giving very specific instructions to the devil of what he can do. And the devil goes and does it. So even in the course of the devil's activities, God, at his discretion and will, can tell the devil specifically how the parameters are of where he can act, what he's allowed to do, when he can do it. And I believe this is setting a precedent for God telling the devil when he can have his seat. God told him from Genesis 3 that he's going to have a seat. God prophesied that. God said, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed, devil, the devil did not have a seat at this time, and her seed. She didn't have a seat at this time. So this is prophetic. Genesis 3.15 is future looking. And so, so the devil's known all along that it's going to happen one day, but he didn't know when. And I think God's going to inform him of when he has permission to do this and, and, take, and take this action, right? Because again, if you think about it, all this is bringing about God's will. Obviously, the testing of Job brought Diane profound revelation that we benefit from you and i benefit from everything job went through because we have this book that shows his faith and not only that the nature of god that we can't even comprehend god's will we're so small in our thinking and who we are compared to god and of course this is what is drawn out throughout the whole book that, that the fact that we suffer in this world and so but there are other examples where god is going to allow angels are directing to do things to bring about his will. And I think there's a, another a final interesting example I want to look at in 1 Kings chapter 22. So this is in verse 19 and 23. And so this is a reference to a war that was going to be fought in, involving King Ahab. And for those who don't know, King Ahab uh, was a very wicked king of Israel who his wife was Queen Jezebel, who was a total idolater. She had a, a a uh, priesthood, uh, basically a demonic priesthood of, of pagan priests who are worshiping Baal and carrying out obviously all this worship to, to idols. She slaughtered uh, prophets. She pursued and persecuted the uh, prophet Elijah. So this was a very bad regime. And so God is going to bring it to an end. And notice how it happens. And so starting in verse 19, this is a really interesting passage involving the prophet Micaiah. And it says, and he said, Hear thou therefore the words of the Lord, uh, 
I saw the Lord, and this is, of course, the prophet speaking, sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. A divine council. Look at this. The host of heaven, the angels on the right hand of God, on the left hand of God. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. So God's, God is saying, I'm taking, a, I'm taking Ahab out. Who's going to uh, go forth to persuade him so he can go and, and die, essentially lose, be conquered at Ramoth Gilead? And there, look what it says here. It says, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken concerning, has spoken evil concerning thee. So isn't this amazing? This angel, the spirit volunteers and says, oh, I'll go. I'll go and just, I'll uh, basically be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. So they can tell him, go to Ramoth Gilead. You're going to win. Ahab, you're going to win. You're going to get the victory. But he's really going to lose. And so, and God directs him. So God directs the spirit and says, okay, you can go and I'm going to let you prevail in this. Again, God is setting all the parameters for something wicked to take place to bring about his will, which is the defeat of this king who's been committing horrific sins for years. And so again, we see all this intersect, the divine counsel, evil before God, and God executing his will and even sending this line, the angel, this spirit to be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets to tell him something that was false, that he's going to get the victory when he was going to lose. So again, I think obviously we can't be dogmatic on this point, on this question, but is it given these examples and how often Satan is before God's throne, it doesn't seem to me like a stretch for God to say, now is the time I'm going to permit you to go do this and go have your seed, which he already told the devil he was going to have back in the Garden of Eden. So that's how I arrive on the answer of the timing. So I think I believe the devil doesn't know the timing, but he'll be told that he's now permitted to do this and carry out this act, which will lead to the birth of the Antichrist, who, of course, by the time he's an adult, will then be the full-fledged Antichrist of the Great Tribulation in the Book of Revelation, and who will be conquered by Yeshua, the Messiah, uh, as we read in the Book of Revelation, chapter 19. So that is my answer to question number three. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Great, great questions tonight. We're way over time. So I'll probably try and do one or two questions really quick before we get to our winners and wrap this show up. Let's see. All right. Moldy Soldier said, listen to Dr. Michael Heiser teach about it. Not going to argue about ludicrous things. Okay. It was entertaining though. All right. Well, I do like uh, Michael, Michael Heiser. So let's see. Let's see here. Um, let's see, we have, I'm looking for one or two questions. Sharon Cross said, question, wondering what language did God and the devil communicate with in tonight's passages? A great question. I, I believe that the original language of the, of the world was Hebrew in the Bible. So potentially, but that's a great question. I'll just uh, that's I've never I've never really thought about that. OK, let's see. I'll look for one or two more that if I can answer quickly. OK, Lindsay said, were there Nephilim in the promised land at the time of Abraham? Great question. So my answer to that is yes. Uh, and I think we see this clearly demonstrated in Genesis chapter 14, which in Judgment of the Nephilim, uh, which someone's going to win tonight, two people, I should say, I, I call that the, the Nephilim World War. In Genesis 14, we see this war between two coalitions, a five-king coalition and a four-king coalition uh, that are at war because uh, the, the four kings did not stop paying tribute uh, to Kurdi Elomer and his coalition and basically protection money, and they wage war against them. And but to get to them, this is of course the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were among these kings. In order to get to them, they had to cross through the uh, it's basically the center of Israel, and there that's where you see a, a number of Nephilim tribes mentioned the Zuzims, the Emims, the Rephaims, um, 
are all mentioned there. And uh, so, yes, they are, were definitely in the, of course, this time of Abraham, this is when Lot was kidnapped and Abraham went and rescued him with 318 of his servants. So yes, they were definitely Nephilim around uh, in the days of Abraham. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to try and get one more. Let's see if I can find one more really quickly. All right. Um, can't find anything. I'm going to go at the beginning real quick. Let's see. Lots of good commentary, but that's it. Okay, so... Great show tonight, and uh, let me see if I can find one more. No, we're just going to, okay, we'll just wrap it up. So, all right, let me get to see our first winner of the night. And again, you're going to win a copy of Judgment of the Nephilim. Signed and autographed and shipped to you anywhere in the world is... Ida Brown. Ida Brown, congratulations. You are our first winner, and you'll get a free copy of Judgment of the Nephilim. And our second winner is Tim Davis. Tim Davis, congratulations. So again, you can contact me uh, at judgmentofthenephilim.com. You can contact me on my social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, DM me or through my website and send me your content information. You will get your autographed copies of Judgment of the Nephilim. So again, great show tonight. For more information, you see the information on the bottom. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about the books, the study guides, we also have study guides for both books as well. Uh, for those who want to get deeper, the documentaries, you can find it all at judgmentofthenephilim.com. Please, please subscribe to my social media. And I will add, uh, I did, I'm constantly being asked now about conferences. I am, I have another conference on the calendar, but it's going to be in 2023. I'll have information on all this stuff soon, but it's going to be uh, in Orlando. I will be doing my first conference in Florida in March of next year. So I'm excited for that as well. So great questions tonight. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and Lord willing, see you next Thursday.